Well, good afternoon or evening um, if you're joining us from North America or in fact, good morning if you're in Australia um, where uh, myself and the rest of the, the panel are today. Um, my name's John T. Hall and I'm the recruitment coordinator here in, in veterinary agricultural sciences at the University of Melbourne. Um, so I'm uh, one of the people you would talk to with any questions about future study. Um, I'm uh, excited today to have a panel um, including uh, Associate Professor Brett Tennant-Brown, who is our current course coordinator of the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, um, as well as two of our current students who are from North America, um, Chloe Roberts from the USA and Elisa Pura from Canada. And um, we'll be hearing uh, from, from all three today about, um, in Brett's case, about the course and from both of our, our students about what it's been like to be a Melbourne DVM student. Um, before we get underway, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the traditional lands um, on which uh, the University of Melbourne is situated, which is the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nations in Australia, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, with that said, um, I think now would be the right time to hand over to Brett to tell you a bit about the course. Um, if you do have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, we will actually have a Q&A after Brett, Chloe and Elisa have actually all had a chance to speak. So pop them in the box and we'll get to them um, at the end. So I'll hand over to Brett now. Thanks, John, and thanks for the introduction. Now, can everybody hear me okay? And can everybody see my screen? I think everybody can see my screen. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Brett and I am an equine medicine specialist and I'm now the DVM director. So I'm going to just give you a brief run through of our program. And if I can make my slides advance, which this stage is totally defeating me. There we go. All right. So the University of Melbourne is the oldest vet school in Australia, and we haven't quite been operating continuously for 100 years, but we have been teaching veterinary medicine uh, for over 100 years. We have, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but we operate across two campuses. We have the central campus, which is in at Parkville, that's close to the, the CBD of Melbourne. And then we have the teaching hospital and out at Werribee, which is about 25 minutes drive from, from Parkville. And both of those uh, campuses have recently had uh, lovely new upgrades and fantastic new facilities, which I'll show in, in a minute. So the DVM program at the University of Melbourne is a four year graduate entry program, and it allows you direct entry into the veterinary profession. And so there's no requirement like human medicine to do uh, internships. You can do internships, but there's no requirement. You can go straight into and you're ready to qualify and, and practice as a veterinarian once you've finished the degree. We have one intake per year. Uh, our semesters run a little bit differently to how they do in North America. So we start uh, late February, early March, and actually in DVM4, by the time you get through to the end of the year, we start in, in mid-January. Each year we take in about 140 students, and of those 140, we have about 50 places reserved for international students. Now, of course, rankings and numbers aren't all uh, aren't everything, but we are really proud of the University of Melbourne of where we do rank in the world. So the Melbourne Vet School is the number one vet school in Australia. The University of Melbourne is ranked well within the top 50 of all universities around the world, which makes it, makes it a very well regarded and well respected university. And our vet school is ranked 16th in the world. So again, a, a very well ranked and well regarded program. And one of the really important things to understand about our program is that it is accredited by our local accreditation agency, so that's the Australian or Australasian Veterinary Boards Council, but really importantly for international students, it's also accredited with the American Veterinary Medical Association and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. And what that means is that graduates from our DVM program can go and work all around the world, but really importantly in the United Kingdom and the United States and Canada without sitting any additional 
exams or, or without attaining any additional qualifications. Now you will, of course, if you're practicing in North America, need to sit the NAVLE and depending on which state you're going to practice in, you might need to pass a state licensing exam. But, but that would be the same for a, the graduate of a, of a North American program. So that's a real advantage and a real strength of our program is that accreditation with those two really important bodies. So right at the beginning, we talked about how our, our course is split across two campuses. The Parkville campus is in close to the city, and that's where you'll spend most of your time for your DVM one and two years. You'll, you'll spend a day each week out at the Werribee campus doing animal handling and so on, but all your lab-based activities, all your lecture-based activities will be conducted in at Parkville. That's had a beautiful new uh, building just completed, which has got a whole range of lovely new uh, dissection spaces. It's got this really amazing uh, anatomy lab with all these specimens on, on display. It's also got a lot of collaborative learning spaces. And one of the things that we do uh, in DVM 1 and 2 is try to introduce those students into the ways of clinical thinking. And we do that, do that in small groups. So talking to your peers, building up cohort uh, experiences and working your way through cases. And we've found that a really useful way to get to get students who are learning those fundamental sciences, those fundamental building blocks for veterinary medicine, start to think like a veterinarian. When you come out to, when you get to DVM three and four, uh, which is the years that I'm, I mostly teach in, um, you'll come out to the Werribee campus. And so as I mentioned, this is about a 25 minutes drive from the CBD. And there's two new really exciting buildings out here. We have the, the learning and teaching building. Those are the images on the left. And so that's, that's full of lab spaces. We've got the surgery suite there where students can practice surgeries and clinical skills. And then the part that I'm most excited about are the images on the right, which is the new renovated teaching hospital. And our teaching hospital has a general practice. That's a really important part of our DVM4 program. We also have small animal referral medicine and surgery services there and our emergency and critical care services. We have a really strong group of uh, anesthetists who all have a real interest in pain management. And to support those services, we have uh, visiting cardiologists and ophthalmologists. So we will offer a wide range of referral level services in addition to that general practice. Supporting those client facing clinical uh, services, we have clinical and anatomical pathology, and we have a diagnostic imaging team that has all sorts of fancy equipment, including a standing CT, uh, CTs that we can fit uh, horses into as well as small animal patients and uh, MR unit. Those are, the, those are the programs and the rotations that we run out at Werribee. In addition to that, we have some rotations that are held at uh, partner practices or what we call distributive practices. So we have a, a really great relationship with the Lost Dogs Home, which is a shelter medicine and surgical facility or practice located in North Melbourne and students will spend some time there. The university owns a very busy uh, equine hospital in Shepparton, which is about two, two and a half hours drive north of the city and students will spend time there for their equine rotations. And then we've got uh, partnerships with uh, about eight at this stage, mixed animal practices. So those are large animal, farm animal, food animal practices and students will spend some time there during the fourth year as well. So I've talked a little bit about what the course looks like, but just to summarize that in the first year, so DVM1, we'll introduce students to the scientific basis of animal health and disease. And we also spend quite a lot of time developing animal handling skills. So for students that don't have a lot of exposure to large animals, so horses and cattle and so on, this is an opportunity to, to help those students get up to speed so they're comfortable and safe handling those bigger creatures. In the second year, we continue those building blocks, continue to establish that fundamental knowledge 
more animal handling, and then we start to have some non-clinical placements. So these are placements on farms and so on during the breaks between semesters, during the summer holidays, and those will start to give you an appreciation of and put into context some of the animal health or some of the animal production systems that we have in this part of the world. DVM3, and I mentioned this is the year that I primarily teach into. This is the clinical transition year. So this is the year where we get students to start thinking like a clinician and starting to put together all that information that we crammed your brains with in DVM1 and 2 and start putting them into a clinical context. And also in DVM3, we have this program called the Pre-Track Program, which focuses on a narrower area of veterinary medicine. So we have small animal medicine, uh, production animal medicine, and, um, um, equine practice, and government industry and conservation health. So we have these four areas where students can gain extra or additional exposure to, a, to a, an area of veterinary medicine that really takes your takes your interest. And then finally DVM4, and I spend quite a lot of time on clinics teaching into DVM4. This is, uh, this is students behaving and working with, uh, behaving as, as junior veterinarians and working with senior veterinarians um, to manage cases. So we, we the, the teaching hospital runs like a regular veterinary practice. Uh, we'll take in a whole range of cases, we'll work with clients, work those animals up, hopefully arrive at a diagnosis and then start managing them. And in addition to that, uh, we, there's opportunity for students to get what we call extramural experience. And so those are placements that occur outside of the hospital and this allows you to supplement the training that you have within the University of Melbourne teaching hospital. So this is just a little map showing where some of uh, where our students go to take those placements. It's probably actually not not totally complete, but um, students have the option to travel really anywhere they would like in the world, and to to um, to undertake what we call these extramural placements. So lots of North American students will travel back and spend spend some time at home working in vet clinics back in North America. Our students from China and Southeast Asia will return home and spend time working in practices there. We also have students going and practicing in Ireland and the United Kingdom or England. And then we also have a, um, relationships with a couple of practices in Europe where students can go to as well. Of course, most of our students will spend time in Australia and and actually a requirement of the course is that you do 50% of these extramural placements in Australia. I think when all of us think about veterinary medicine and think about where we'll end up at the end of our program, most of us think that we'll end up in private practice, but our graduates actually have really a really wide range of options and have managed to do all sorts of things with their veterinary degree. Lots of our graduates will go into private practice, but we have really good success with our uh, graduates getting internship placements, and then uh, a portion of those will go on and get residencies. So we've got University of Melbourne students that have got residencies from all over the world. Uh, a number of students will go into research to complete a master's or a PhD, and then there's a whole range of options for graduates. So. Uh, government services, coming back to the university to teach, uh, working within agriculture, working within the pharmaceutical industry, and working with the animal welfare agencies. All these are options for graduates. And it's one of the really nice things about the veterinary degree, but our degree in particular, is that this it really opens up a ton of doors for you. So there's all sorts of things that you can you can do. So how do we get in? These are really important questions and uh, Jonty and his team will have more information and be able to answer some of your questions about this. But this, uh, the, the DVM at the University of Melbourne is a graduate degree, so you must complete a science-based undergraduate degree that includes at least one semester study in biology, that can be general or cellular, and some biochemistry. There's a, there's a, a, a not exhaustive or not totally inclusive list of 
several degrees and majors that you might think about. But it's important to recognise that entry into the course is competitive and based primarily on academic merit. And so, so we use scores from the science subjects at the final level, uh, final year level, I should say, and then at the second to last year as well. And they're weighted more heavily towards the final year. I think most of you will be working for on a four point GPA scale. So that gives you an idea of our benchmark. Uh, for those of your universities that use a percentage on your transcripts, we, we look for an average of 75% or higher uh, on your transcripts in your final, final two years. But this is a recent uh, innovation that we've introduced into our program, and this recognises that uh, there's lots of soft skills, and by soft skills I mean things like communication skills, getting on with people, working with people, empathy and so on, that some of those academic criteria don't capture very well. So from 2021, we'll in, we're introducing the CASPA Online Situation Judgment Test, and that is a, t that is a test that helps measure some of those soft skills, which are really important for veterinary medicine. And so uh, we're aiming to choose people that have have some have some um, have some skills in those areas because we recognise that those folks will go on and make really terrific veterinarians. So for international students, uh, you'll need to get a satisfactory performance on that situational judgment test, and there's a link there, and I'm sure that link will be made available later uh, if you'd like to take a look at that and get a feel for what that what that test looks like. The final part of your application is your personal statement, and this is a chance for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, it just needs to be short, so we don't want anything longer than 500 words. And this is an opportunity to tell us a little bit about your work experience. We don't expect you, we don't require you to have um, any experience with veterinarians or, or extensive experience with with uh, particular large animal species or any animal species, but those are all helpful, and certainly if you have some animal experience or some experience with veterinarians working as a nurse or spending time in the practice on weekends or during your holidays and so on, that can really help with your application. And so your personal statement is, a, is an opportunity for you to uh, outline some of that experience. And I think, Jonty, that is all I have. I, Probably, did it, how did I do? Did I get through that quickly enough? Too long, too slow? Um, timing was pretty much spot on, Brett, so thank you for that. Um, uh, it says Q&A session, but I'll actually hand over first to uh, Chloe and then Elisa before we get into the Q&A. Um, so yeah, please think up your questions in the meantime and drop them in the box. But for now, um, I'll hand over to Chloe. Right, and I think I'll have to, I'll stop sharing, Chloe, which should allow you to share your slides. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Um, you can see that. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Chloe. I am a second year here at UniMel. So that means I'm going to be graduating in December 2023. Um, a bit about my background. I went to Colorado State University and I graduated in 2017 with a major in zoology. So how did I end up here? Um, so I did not always want to be a vet. I actually sort of made the decision to pursue the DVM after I graduated undergrad. Um, so I graduated undergrad, didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I just started volunteering places. Um, I started volunteering at the local humane society. And then I eventually got a job there as a welfare specialist, AKA a glorified cleaner. Um, but then I made my way to the med team and got a job as a vet assistant there and really loved my time there, really sort of felt like that was where I was supposed to be. Um, and then also at the same time, I was volunteering at a local marine science center and I had a really wonderful opportunity to actually go to Brazil and look at the Amazon and see firsthand 
an ornamental fish industry there, which was amazing for so many reasons. But I actually there met an aquatic veterinarian and that sort of just opened up my eyes that vets work with more than just cats and dogs. And I have always grown up loving um, aqu uh, aquatics. So I didn't even think that aquatic veterinarian was a thing. So those two experiences sort of led me to um, consider the DVM. And then I also had studied abroad um, at the University of Tasmania um, during my undergrad and absolutely fell in love with the country. So I knew I, if I could, I would love to come back or at the very least um, leave the US again, so go somewhere else. And I just happened to stumble upon the University of Melbourne website, found their DVM program. I had all the prereqs and I applied. Um, Unimel was actually the only vet school I applied to, and here I am. Um, so for me, the decision to come here was just very serendipitous, and it was also a very gut feeling that this was where I was supposed to be. Um, in terms of career aspirations, like I said, I love aquatics. My absolute dream job would be to be a vet for an aquarium. Um, but I've also got to do some placements with aquaculture and have really enjoyed my time there. Um, but I'm also open. Um, if the pandemic has taught me anything, it's that I can't plan for everything. So I'm kind of just seeing where life takes me. I'm open to doing a rotating internship in North America or potentially doing a residency. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm open. I have learn to love certain animals of pet school. I was not a horse person. Still not saying I am a horse person, but I'm coming around to horses. And I've also absolutely fallen in love with sheep while I'm here. So um, yeah, aquatics is where my heart's at, but I'm open to seeing where I go. Um, so some highlights so far. Um, that first bullet point, learning how to use Zoom. So I do have to say, full disclosure, my Pretty much entire first year of vet school was online, unfortunately. Um, we got here for two weeks and then went into lockdown for the whole year, which had its challenges, obviously. It was, um, could be very hard sometimes. But even though we were online, I still managed to meet a decent amount of my cohort and make some really solid friends. So that first image there is our little friend group. We'd have Friday night Zooms. And actually, that Zoom, we decided to all dress in our scrubs just to remind ourselves that we were in vet school. Um, so you'll hear this a bunch, like no matter where you go, but the people in your cohort really do become your family. And that 100% has happened to me, especially with my fellow international students. Um, you just become so close. So that's been one of my highlights so far at BBM. Um, also this year, now that we're back in person, we've got sports going again. Um, so I, I played soccer in like primary school, but um, hadn't really played soccer, but I got roped into playing soccer and it was a wonderful time. And we have a bunch of other recreational sports that is really fun time and you get to meet other people like years above you, just more people in the program. And then this year, finally get to experiencing the wonderful campus that Brett talked about. Um, the, I've mainly spent most of my time in Parkville in the city right now, um, but it's gorgeous. It's a new building and like people from other programs try and come and use the building because they're so nice. Um, and then last point is the faculty. Um, getting to see them in person has been great. Um, I think there's just something about maybe it's the Aussie culture that make the faculty like super welcoming and approachable. Because um, I experienced this when I studied abroad as well. Um, you call professors by their first names here. And that's something that didn't really happen for me in undergrad. It was a bit more formal back in the US, but here, um, I just feel like there's a little bit of a different attitude and um, yeah, the staff are very approachable and it's been oh, so nice getting to see their faces in person and interacting with them. Um, and then also living in Melbourne, 
I love it. Um, it's one of the most livable cities in the world, and I can very much attest to that. Um, that skyline photo at, at the top, that's actually a photo I took right outside my balcony out here. Um, so yeah, I love it. There's so many museums and zoos, a great aquarium, and lots of gardens and parks to go to. Um, it's also a really big sports hub. I got to go to the Australian Open over the summer, and that was so fun. Um, so yeah, we're, even though we are in lockdown, I still have been able to experience a decent amount of the city and loved everything. And then you can always escape the city as well. There's some really beautiful countryside outside of the city um, that's like an hour away. So if you need a break from the city, you can do it. Um, yeah, that was my fast paced quick. Um, I guess I can pass it on to Elisa now, who will give you a better snapshot of what vet school is like pre-COVID. Yeah. Thanks for that, Chloe. Um, yeah, great yeah, to no hear that, that uh, you found it a welcoming experience coming here. Most definitely, yeah. yeah. And you're um, surrounded by fellow internationals as well. So you definitely, you feel welcomed and sometimes you also feel at home because you, you'll, yeah, you'll be North Americans as well. Yeah. Um, I think take it away, Lisa. Can you all see that and hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So hello everyone, um, I'm Elisa Pira. I am originally from Canada, I'm from a northern part of Ontario. So I did my Bachelor of Science um, degree at the University of Guelph and I graduated in 2016 and I am a third year of vet student and so I graduate in December 2022, which is honestly very crazy to say that. I can't believe I'm already in third year. Um, so Similarly to Chloe, I also didn't uh, want to be a vet. I initially actually wanted to be a teacher, which is kind of in line with, you know, vet school and being a vet, you are teaching um, in some way, shape or form. So like I said, I did a University of uh, Guelph degree and I studied animal biology, which was a really lovely time. I had a lot of fun in that degree. So working up uh, to my entrance into the DVM program, Ever since I was 12, um, I have been involved in the standard racing industry, which is actually where I wanted to become a vet, was I wanted to be an equine vet, um, which my thoughts have now changed, but I really do enjoy horses. Um, I met a trainer there who kind of pushed me into wanting to be a vet, and I am forever grateful for him. I volunteered at a local general practitioner, so just at a local animal hospital, which was really lovely. I had a really good time there. And then I essentially um, became a surgical assistant after I completed my degree at Guelph. I did that for two years. I worked for um, an orthopedic and a neuro veterinary surgeon. Had a lovely time there, was involved in some insane surgeries. Uh, the top photo on the left there, that's my own dog getting a hip replacement done. So I did that, um, got some research under my belt, and was also able to speak at a vet conference before I even got into vet school. So for me, my career aspirations is I do want to track small animals for my third and fourth year. Initially, I was equine, but that has recently changed. I want to do an internship and then hopefully transition into a surgical residency, hopefully in the States, but we will see. And the photo on the left hand side there, again, it's just me in surgery with dog hip replacement. So, like Brett was saying, um, you do get to do two, I guess, essential blocks of DVM placements. You do your preclinical one, which you do in first and second year, and then third and fourth year, you do your clinical one. So um, I guess it kind of reminds you of why you're here because you are a lot of the time are stuck in lecture or in practical and you kind of lose sight of why you're doing this. 
And so for me, that was a really good experience, not only to see the country of Australia as well, but also to get a lot of hands-on experience. And you, prior to COVID, we were able to travel internationally to do so. So for me, I, I did an apocalypse farm at home. I did a Joey Sanctuary in Gippsland, which is east of here. And so that's the top and bottom photos on the right-hand side there. Did a feedlot um, in Victoria, which was an experience. And then I did an extensive bee, bee farm up in northern Queensland, which is a top left photo, which was really eye-opening, especially being from Canada and where we have a lot of snow and precipitation. It is insane to see the lack of, of water that they get year-round. And then I also did a standard racehorse um, placement, which is a bottom photo. I didn't really learn much of that placement because of my knowledge previously, but it was probably my favorite placement out of all of them just because they're horses. So some of the highlights, like Chloe mentioned, you meet fellow international students who will become your family and that definitely got exacerbated by the global pandemic and their inability to go home. Um, you are, they will be your main support system. You'll, you might even meet different international students from different uni level programs because there are a lot of us over here. Um, for me, most of my friends are international students. I think I have one Australian friend who's in my close-knit circle. That's pretty much it. You can also participate in sports teams. Um, in first year, I did uh, like soccer and basketball. Um, they're bringing back volleyball this year, COVID pending. So definitely do that. And like Chloe said, you get to learn and you get to meet, sorry, a lot of the upper years, which is quite lovely. You can do DVM social events. So that's like the top left photo of us being in Toronto Maple Leaf jerseys. Um, that was uh, that cruise in my first year. So it's essentially what you would be if you were to that school and me and my friend decide to dress up as hockey wives. Um, the new learning teaching buildings that Brett mentioned as well, they are really stunning and really beautiful. And we're really lucky to have those types of facilities are definitely top notch. And prior to COVID, the ability to travel, um, we are so close to other countries in comparison to North America. And the, the flights are honestly quite cheap. Um, me and my roommate, we actually just got back from a trip to WA. So we just came back from Perth. We took a couple of red-eye flights, but we made it work. Um, so you just get to do a lot of different things here if you take advantage of your time. And obviously, given COVID and how that is going to shape the future of travel. So my advice is, this is going to be for regardless of where you end up with your DVM degree, is to join clubs, get involved. We have a student council here, um, which is another good way to meet the upper years if you're in first year. Participate in events. So we did bat chats in first year. So they were doing a three-day event, and we just took heart rates and temperatures after the race. And then once they reach a certain threshold, they're able to exit that area. So we just helped the vets there. Um, Friday things, which again, pre-COVID, you were able to go to events and just meet the upper year, just have a few drinks, have some free pizza, which is awesome. Self-care is super important. Remember, burnout's massive. Um, it's a really common thing. I unfortunately experienced burnout before I even got into the degree um, in this profession. So just be mindful of that. Um, hang out with other students. If you need to go see psychology, there's multiple different ways to help yourself and to set yourself up for success and finally like enjoy the journey i'm in third year i can't believe it already time flies i don't know where the last three years went um so don't wish it away is my suggestion and finally the finances which is kind of like the nitty and gritty um it's not the best way to end the presentation but it is pretty important um, for me, anyways, I spent $19,000 my first year living here um, at, in a studio apartment right in the heart of CBD. Um, I now pay like a half to a quarter of that now that I'm out in a western suburb, but it is important to let you guys know that rent here is expensive. OSAP, if you're from Ontario, that's an option. They have increased it. Don't quote me on these prices as they might change but we got 50, just over 15,000 for the entire year that's helpful um, but bank funding is quite limited um, unfortunately when I was looking there was no company or bank that would give me the entire $290,000 I'm paying to be here 
which is unfortunate. Um, so you might need to outsource that in any other forms that you can think of, like parents or anything like that. So unfortunately, it is expensive and it is a real thing that we, that we do need to discuss. And those are just some cute photos that I thought to make this slide less daunting. And that's pretty much it, honestly. If you guys have any questions, I threw my Instagram handle there at the bottom, as well as my email. So thank you for coming, and hopefully we'll be able to see you guys. Thanks, Elisa. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's great to hear another perspective. Um, it, uh, I don't, didn't realize that um, your year, Chloe, had spent basically half their degree um, online. I thought maybe some of it was, but um, it, you, Elisa, you've had, I guess, uh, about a third online so far. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, COVID has been obviously a big game changer for everyone. Um, and uh, we're, we're um, in a, well, Brett will probably talk more about, about how that's been working, but, um, what I'll do now um, is um, move into the Q&A segment. Um, we've got a couple of questions that come through so far, but um, please do send through any other questions you have because we are all here to, to answer them. Um, and I'll start with this one that's come through from Palm who, who asks about, do you work with wildlife as well? Um, Brett, did you want to talk a bit about the um, uh well yeah about about placements and tracks and maybe how that works with the gitch track and stuff like that yeah there's a couple of opportunities to work with wildlife and uh elisa and chloe have also shown that there's opportunities outside of the course to participate in those sort of activities as well but from the dvm3 uh, pre-track program there's a government industry and in conservation health that's run by one of our one of our veterinarians that is um, a researcher in conservation health and conservation welfare. And so there's, there's a, a, quite a number of opportunities there to work with wildlife. Uh, and in DVM4, <clears throat> we do have some exotics. We do have an exotics caseload that comes through our hospital. So we have all sorts of uh, exotic pets and weird and wonderful things that come through our general practice. But there's also a number of exotic veterinarians, so exotic private practices scattered around Melbourne. And so students with an interest in that will spend time at those clinics. And then as Chloe and Elisa have shown, there are opportunities to work for um, some of the local sanctuaries and so on and spend time at the local sanctuaries, particularly in the fourth year. Um, yeah, um, it it's probably worth pointing out you don't need to choose your track when you get here it's you've got a, at least a couple of years i think you've been here for that yes um, yeah that's that's exactly that's exactly right so you don't need to don't need to worry about and the overall aim of the dvm program is to is to produce veterinarians that are broadly qualified and so we don't steer students down this very narrow sort of focus um but but really, by, particularly by the time they get to the fourth year, there's a lot of opportunity to spend time in an area that you're you're interested in. So so lots of lots of lots of possibilities there. Um, we've got our next question here, which is from Harita, who asks, um, "I'm an undergraduate student in the US to be graduating in May 2022, and uh, Harita is going to apply through VMCAS." Um, now, for those who don't know, VMCAS is a, a North American application portal for vet schools, and it does allow you to apply for a number of schools at once. So if you are thinking about the University of Melbourne, but you're also looking to apply closer to home, um, VMCAS is a, a good way to, to kind of maybe cut down your paperwork by, by doing a lot of, of vet school applications at once. Um, VMCAS, uh, Heritas asks, um, she's noticed our deadlines are different um, and that the school year starts in February, March. Um, I was as confused as to what the timeline looked like and when I should apply. Um, the, the short answer to that, Harita, is um, you would need to apply um, in, in the year prior to when you want to start. So we have a February commencement in semester one um, and we only have that 
for DVM. We have a mid-year intake for other courses, but for DVM, it's always February. Um, what that means is that even though VMCAS is now open, um, and I think for, that'll be open for North American schools for their September or their fall semester next year, um, you can't actually apply to us yet if you're not going to finish until May because um, we will be looking to fill the class that commences in February next year. So at the moment, um, yeah, unless you're going to finish your studies in 2021 or you've already finished, you would be looking at applying next year instead. Um, I don't think um, either of you would have used VMCAS, Chloe, or Lisa. So I personally did it, but I know a lot of people in my cohort did. So I did use VMCAS. Oh. Um, not really the smartest idea because it really only applied to uni Meld. Um, so if you're only applying to one school, um, don't do it because it costs more money. Um, so if you're only going to apply to uni Meld, which is what I ended up doing, um, just apply through uni Meld is my suggestion. Oh, there's also OzTrack in Canada if you're from Canada. So check them out. Um, they're a lovely group of people. So do that. Yes, worth mentioning, um, if you want a hand with your application, um, Austrac actually now also do um, work with American students. So um, if you're from US or Canada, um, I think one of my colleagues will be able to drop the, the Austrac uh, website in, in the chat box. But um, uh, yeah, Austrac, um, uh, are happy to help you with your application. Um, they work on, on a commission basis, so you won't actually pay anything yourself to use Austrac services. Um, it's it's the universities that that pay um, pay, pay the agency um, to place students. Um, our next question here is: um, other than COVID, what's been the most what have been the most challenging aspects of this program? Um, yeah, I guess mate, Tony Lisa who wants to go first. Uh, um, for me, anyways, obviously this is kind of COVID related, but you're eventually going to get homesick. Um, I mean, for me, anyways, I probably won't be going home to the end of my degree because of COVID at this point, which will be three years without seeing my family, um, which is challenging. Um, you will probably get homesick around the major holiday events. Um, Thanksgiving in particular, I found was when a lot of us um, got homesick. You're like, we're almost done, we're almost done, and then like Thanksgiving hits and you're kind of sad about that um so that's challenging but in terms of academic wise each year is a step up of what they expect from you um so i found from first and second to second year it was a massive jump um which is in, like it's just it's just a lot going from having four exams to having six or seven exams in three weeks is a lot and then Second to third year um, is also a really big jump. They just have a higher level, a higher level of expectation, um, which is fair. You're moving through a, like a, a professional program that's going to happen, um, but is a really big change from the undergrad. Um, so just be careful with that. But I'm sure that once you get into your DVM degree, you'll figure it out. You'll get through it. We all do. Um, so yeah, just be on your students, your staff. Um, we're all there to help. Um, yeah, for me, I think it's uh, comparing yourself to others. That's something that I'm still working on, but I've gotten better um, because that school is the top of the class and you're all put in the same boat together. Um, so your cohort is like super smart, um, but just keeping those blinders on and just staying in your own lane and just um, doing you and it's a challenge for sure but i but you can get better at it but yeah just following your own path and staying in your own lane yeah great thanks guys um next question here um uh, for elisa um I'm a second year animal bio student at Guelph as well. Um, were all the prereqs of vet school fulfilled from your animal bio program? Uh, it says requirements, but I assume uh, subjects uh, or like did you study the right stuff in that degree, I guess? Yeah, so um, the good thing about the animal bio program is it was made solely for entrance into OVC. That is the purpose of that program. Um, 
loved it. You will, it will, it will set, you, set you up for success, even jumping into the DVM degree. I found a lot of the subjects that we were taught um, are touched on in the DVM degree. Um, so you'll actually potentially be ahead of other students in terms of a knowledge base, except, especially from the AR cultural background. Um, if you take courses, I don't know if Vern Osborne's still there, but if you take co courses with him or any of the upper year nutrition courses, it'll be really helpful. Um, so yes, short answer, the program will set you up for success and will hit all the requirements that you need to, to apply here. Great. Um, and another one here, um, it's probably for, for both um, really. Um, have you found the course load to be difficult and challenging? Um, I, I think it's probably been touched on already, right? It kind of ramps up over the degree. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's challenging. It is a graduate course, um, but you can do it. Like it's achievable, um, and it's a lot of trial and error. Like I'm still figuring out what study method works best for me. Um, so yeah, it's like I said. For me, it's more of a. It's challenging, but the toughest part has been more of the mental health side um and we are very well supported in that regard like i have a lot of options so yes it's challenging but you can do it you can do it for sure yeah i would definitely um piggyback on that um, and say it is challenging but like, like chloe said you just have to you will get through it it's going to be tough um you're in a you're going to be a doctor at the end of the day it's it's going to be challenging and if you don't think that then um you need to realize that but it is a really good experience. It's a lot of fun. Um, you will probably be knocked down a couple of times, but just build yourself back up, um, talk to your friends and definitely keep the blinders on. I struggle with that a lot myself. Um, so just try and like Chloe said, stay in your own lane. Um, there, you're gonna have weaknesses and different strengths to different people. So for me, um, I do have a horse background, but my horse background isn't intense where one of my classmates she has a ton of horse experience so just ask her for help if anything like horse related um so yeah just work hard you'll get through it um and try not to get stressed out about the grades i know we all do especially in our entire life we've been told like you know get good grades get good grades get good grades uh, and that essentially is a definition of your worth um but um, that changes in vet school i know a lot of profs try and you know, say, don't worry about the grades. It's really hard to break that mentality. Um, I'm still working on it, but um, try not to focus so much on grades and enjoy the journey is my suggestion. Um, do, do you have an, an advice, Brett, from all the students you meet about, you know, what, what to freak out about and what not to freak out about? Well, <laughs> then I don't have advice about what not to freak about. I think people, it is an intense course and it's a challenging course. And there is a, there is a large volume of, of material to work your way through. And I think uh, all of us, when we saw that, uh, were a little bit uh, overwhelmed. But, but, you know, a marathon starts with your first footstep. And so you've just got to work your way through it. Um, try not to get stressed out about stuff that's not important. And I think Chloe and Lisa have both said really important things about not worrying too much about where everybody else is at and not trying to compare yourself to, to everybody else and work your way through the course. Um, try and look for opportunities to, you'll learn a lot of information that's really hard to see, well, how does that fit into what, to me becoming a veterinarian? It does fit in and it's easy, if you can apply it to a context so you understand where it fits in, then it becomes easier to remember. So there's lots of little skills like that, looking for how that information um, fits in. And I think probably time management is a really important skill, understanding that you know, the, you, we need to spend some time going over this material but make sure you're working through that material in a sort of an efficient and ordered, an ordered fashion. And people will have different ways of doing that. There's a great academic skills unit at the University of Melbourne that can help people with the, all that sort of stuff. 
um, and find a find a technique that works for you, and then just plug away, plug away, and you will get there. You will get there at the end. People that get into vet school, <clears throat> um, you know, for the most part, graduate with their de graduate with the degree. So it's um, you know, once you get once you get in, you, you'll um, most of our students succeed. Yes, I've I've heard it's a very high um, I guess retention rate or like. The, the cohort seems to stick together pretty well through the whole degree. But. Yeah, the, I mean, there's some, there's some inevitably some people that will get into the to the first year course and go, oh, gee, because I'm not sure this is quite quite for me. But like I say, you know, in some regards, I've often thought that the hardest part about veterinary medicine is actually getting into the veterinary medicine course. Once once you're there, it's some hard work, uh, but you'll get there in the end. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, this one again is for Elisa. Um, Elisa, how have you found studying at Melbourne compared to Ontario? Um, that's a great question. I don't know if I can fully answer. Um, I guess one thing I really enjoy about it is that we start and end in the same calendar year, which really confuses people back home, but I prefer it. Um, I guess it's it's really hard to compare one or the other because I did an undergraduate degree and now I'm doing a doctorate degree, um, which are vastly different. Um, I've enjoyed both my experiences thus far. They're both great. Um, and like Chloe said, like living here is awesome. You, it's a really really livable city. I am not from a big city. My hometown is five thousand people, um, and then to come to a city that has six million people is a really big jump. Um, but you get used to it. I love Melbourne. Um, the course itself is really unique in terms of the sense that it's a fully integrated program. So for us, like we don't have a histology class or a pathology class. It's, everything's intermingled, which can be a blessing and a curse. I'm not good with, with pathology whatsoever. Always the worst marks in all of the exams. Um, but like it's, it's good in the sense of that you don't have to segregate your learning and that you're learning it like all together at one time. You don't have to have all these different courses, which I thoroughly enjoy, um, which I know is different from North American vet colleges. Um, but it's really hard to compare the two. Um, they're both really good experiences and they're both tough in their own way, given your life experiences up to that point. Um. Yeah, Chloe, what about you? Did you, it, were you at Colorado? Was that your, your undergrad? Yeah. Um, so at least from an American perspective, I think probably one of the toughest part is the actual like marking <laughs> is different. So like here, 50% is a pass. We're back home. It was more like 60, 70%. Um, so yeah, for Americans, it's just a bit more of just adjusting your scale. So like for back home, I was aiming for like 90%. But here, anything above an 80% is like an A plus. So it's just um, yeah, readjusting your scale. And also in undergrad, um, we had more multiple like assignments or exams throughout the semester. So more opportunities to build up your marks. Where here it's, and this may be just more of a vet school thing, um, but it is more you have a midterm and a final exam and that's it um so yeah but mainly the marks thing for an american student yeah that's similar back home as well um just mm. to jump on that um our yeah like our um i guess no i guess from back home it was 50 percent was a fail as well below that mm. um but i mean it's like what we said it's just like changing a level of expectation um here there the mostly averages I would say are around like high 60s which they consider like good which is like shocking um at first like at first you're like oh crap like okay um especially just you know you work so hard in your undergrad to get those you know mid 80s low 90s to get into a college back home and then you come here and it's a huge shock um but you'll get used to it um, <laughs> eventually <laughs> Um, two more questions. I think we're nearly um, out of time. Um, uh, 
you. We have, um, oh, um, in terms of the program itself, is it is there a lot of, um, is it seminar based and there are lots of presentations or is it more um, practicals, labs and, and classroom work? Um, obviously some of that has probably changed a bit with COVID anyway. Brett, did you want to quickly talk about maybe the balance of practical in the later years versus earlier years and, and stuff like that? Uh, our, our aim is to get contact hours per week to around about the mid twenties, 25 contact hours per week or 25 hours dedicated to sort of studying. And our aim is to have that a third classroom base and then a third uh, practical base and a third collaborative learning activity. So we try and so, so there is quite a heavy lecture component and that turns out to be a really good way to get across information, but there's lots of other types of opportunities to, to learn. And, and based on my experience with the other vet schools I've worked at, our, our practical load, our hands-on stuff is really pretty high. We, we, we give students lots of opportunities to, to practice hands-on stuff with live animals and lots of opportunities to practice clinical skills. So, so yeah, does that kind of, does that kind I, of answer? I, I, yeah, I think that that covers it. I mean, um, yeah, it, it, it's um, suffice to say, it's basically a full-time job to be a vet student, I think. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, we definitely do have students that do some, some work alongside their studies, particularly in the first couple of years, but, um, yeah, um, I imagine and neither of you are in fourth year yet, but I've heard that it's pretty, pretty much just full on placements the whole year. Um, but um, yeah, it always amazes me because I was never smart enough to do this, John T. Um, but um, we do have some students that, and I take my hats off, and we do have some students who hold down part time jobs, actually across the whole course. But it's that's that's ch that's that's challenging. And DVM for it is DVM for it does become a little bit ch more challenging because there's some after hours requirements and some weekend work across the year. So it can be it can be difficult to difficult in, in a time fashion to fit in a part time job, but also I think um, difficult in terms of a sort of just a capacity. Um, yeah, so it, 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 I mean it is challenging. Um, I have recently picked up a job actually at our teaching hospital. Um, and I find it challenging kind of just to balance everything. I know that some students, um, they get jobs outside of the vet profession um, just to help with their sanity. Like one of my uh, housemates um, works at the ice hockey rink to like really chat with her inner Canadian. So it's, it's just something, you know, to keep your mind off of it um, and to meet more people, I guess. So it's really up to you whether or not, I guess, in a financial situation, whether or not you work, but it will be challenging um, and it does again, take away from study time, relaxation time, and you kind of need to factor that into the time management throughout your week. Great. Um, last question. Um, when selecting an applicant, are you looking mainly at the grades or also the experience and the interview? Um, well, first of all, we don't normally have interviews, um, which may be reassuring to some of you in, in the audience. Um, we do have the CASPER test and grades and Brett, did you want to talk about that one or otherwise I'm happy to, to talk to it? Yeah, the CASPER is a new innovation, Jonty, so you might have a little bit more insight to that one. Uh, but um, at this stage, the CASPER makes up 25% of the, sort of the grade that we award to the app application. And then your marks from the final two years of your undergraduate course contribute 75%. And the personal statement, um, now, John, you tell me, you might be able to fill me in. What, what's, the, what's the contribution from the personal statement, which is that opportunity to show sort of work experience and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so it, the, the actual, the admissions process is reasonably complex and there is, um, already has been posted in our, in the chat, a guide, a full selection guidelines, which will walk you through all of that. Um, the main thing to know is that, that your grades are still the single most important element in, in selection. Um, and if you're applying for next year, you would be evaluated on what's called a science GPA, where we only look at your science subjects and only the ones you've taken at final year level and um, penultimate or second to final year level. Um, 
that will actually be changing from the 2023 intake onwards to be um, a, a what we're calling a weighted average mark system instead. Um, we will still be looking at final year and penultimate year level subjects, but um, we will include all subjects, not just science subjects. So if you've got a, an undergrad where you've done, you know, electives in um, in French or ancient history or something like that, if they're at penultimate or final year level, they would still count towards your your um, that side of your admissions prospects. Um, as I see, that is the main thing we look at. Um, there are up to four bonus points available for the personal statement. So, you know, if someone's sitting on a, um, a 75, that might bump them up to 79 if they, get, if they submit a really good personal statement. Um, and that personal statement also includes mentioning uh, volunteering experiences with with animals or um, yeah other relevant experience you may have we have a number of students who've done some vet nursing or um, or other things before they come into the course um, and then for international students um, the CASPER test is a requirement but it's um we, we, don't, we don't actually publish a specific score but you do need to perform satisfactorily in that test to get in it won't actually be part of your GPA though. So um, for domestic students, it counts for 25% of your overall score, but for internationals, it's a kind of yes or no, um, effectively pass fail system. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, we've, we've gotten through all the questions. Um, I, uh, in the invitation for this event, I think we did promise um, a sneak peek of the, uh, of the Werribee campus, which you see in the photo behind me. Unfortunately, because Melbourne has just gone into a, into a lockdown due to a, a fairly small, uh, so far, COVID outbreak that has just happened, we're not actually on campus today, um, so we weren't able to do that. Um, I will just post in the chat a couple of links, though, um, because we do have a, virtu a virtual tour available um, of both, which includes Parkville and Werribee. Um, and um, if you'd like to have a look around the campus, I'd highly recommend checking that out. Um, there's also uh, just a quick video, it's about a minute and a half long, um, which is um, a lot of nice shots and some drone footage of the outside of the building and also a bunch of filming that was done inside just after we opened that building. So that's the actual <coughs> me, Melbourne Vet School teaching area. Um, but um, the Parkville campus is where you would spend the majority of your, your first couple of years. Um, um, Yes, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope that enlightened you all a bit about what, what the Melbourne DVM is all about. Um, and um, I just want to thank um, Brett and Chloe and Elisa very much for, for being here and sharing um, their insights with us. Um, if you do have any questions, please just visit our website, um, drop us an inquiry, we'll get back to you within a couple of days. Um, as um, you would have also seen in the chat, um, my colleagues, um, Todd and Julia, who are actually based in, in the USA, um, are also available for, um, for consultations. So if you want to chat to someone that's on your own time zone, um, you can click the links in the chat and book a, a chat with Todd or Julia um, over Zoom. Um, they'll be able to, to tell you a bit more about applying for the university. Um, they're also kind of our gurus on, on all things uh, North America. So they, if you have questions about loans and things like that, they're, they're going to be in a better position to answer those than, than, than we are back in Melbourne. Um, so yeah, please don't hesitate to, to book a consultation. Um, otherwise, um, thanks all for coming. Um, we will be posting the recording of this as well. If anyone um, came, came in halfway through um, and um, Yes, have a good evening if you're in, in North America and a good rest of your day if you're here in Australia. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.